I was a sailor boy. I went out sailing. I went out to the sea. I had a small cocker shell boat and I would sail it as far as I possibly could, as rashly as I could. And I was very happy, so long as there was vastness, space, and no people. Then the minute I had to come back on land, things began to break. For me, therefore, it was a state of fullness, a state of want. And soon it became a distressing absence. Well, not distressing, but oppressing. I felt suffocated when I was on land. In fact, I spent 20 years of my life suffocating family, friends education. It all seemed so small, so narrow. You couldn't breathe freely. Everything grates. And the only plenitude I had was physical. And I'm not sure about plenitude either, because that's just another word. There was no longer any I, no longer any words. I just felt at ease with myself when I was on the sea. It felt terrible when I came back on land. The trouble is you can't spend all your time on a boat. Looking back on all that, one could say, well, yes, it was just growing pains. People came up with all sorts of uh, psychological explanations. But for me, it was only one thing, a want. A child has a want of something. I often feel that whatever I may have found today at 57, I used to live it, breathe it, when I was six or seven years old on the sea in Brittany. So yes, my origin is something physical. But in fact, for me, truth is physical. It's as simple as that. I can feel it only when it throbs in my body. A state of truth for me is the state in which the body is in harmony. A sense of freedom from all boundaries. Then you know this is true. Everything else is just passing thoughts, not particularly interesting. What is needed is for that to be constant, to live in a state of harmony and truth and plenitude. I had a super religious education. My father was a very religious man. In fact, thanks to him, I was disgusted with religion forever. I felt imprisoned. I felt they were trying to put something over me. And all my life, from a very early age, I've never been able to be imprisoned by something. It was in my very chromosomes, or whatever you want to call it. To feel imprisoned was unbearable. I couldn't stand that religious influence from my father and family. They sent me to a Jesuit school and I hated religion. I hated anything that would confine you. A church meant a building and for me to go and sit in a building was the first lie. I felt life when there were no walls. Then you knew a certain rhythm that made it easy for you. So those walls, it could have been a, a temple or a mosque, they're all the same to me. For me, anything that's put inside four walls is the first step towards falsehood. I was just 20 
when I was in a concentration camp. I'd been arrested by the Gestapo. I was a member of the resistance. And we had been betrayed. There was a member of the German Count Respionage in our ranks, and we didn't know it. So I was on a sort of mission to warn my fellow comrades and agents of this man's betrayal. But the man I was warning was also a traitor. And as soon as I left his house, he telephoned the Gestapo. And I'd gone about 500 feet from his house, about to get on a streetcar, when suddenly a car from the criminal policy came to a screeching halt in front of me. Out jumped two men, pistols in hand, and arrested me on the spot. It was a bit like a movie, really. But they took me to prison. And then it began. Those are things that we should not, there are things we should not talk about. At any rate, all that broke me, cleansed me wonderfully, dreadfully, but wonderfully, because you see, how many years would it have taken me to get rid of all that social, intellectual, cultural clothing? All the things that had been heaped on me for 20 years. Well, all the things that had been heaped on me was totally shattered. Me included. What I thought was me. There was nothing left of me, you see. But that's the point. What I thought was me was a lot of poetry and music and a little bit of this and a bit of that. But all that was totally shattered. And what was left was a sort of human residue face to face with death and fear and saying to itself but what what is this you see at that moment in life there are no more barriers between the man who's being abused and the abuser the Gestapo man and his victim, the SS man and his prisoner. You are plunged into a horror. They aren't others, you see. You are totally immersed in horror. The horror is not others. It's something within you. So everything I... I might have been, everything I thought I was, was so radically shattered that I was suddenly thrust into the only thing left, my own flesh. Yes, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I felt a fantastic joy. I felt as if I was above it all looking down, almost laughing. I had come out of that devastation into a place that was royal. I was no longer a prisoner. I was no longer assaulted. I was no longer. And I was above it all, almost laughing. And suddenly I felt like that kid again on the sea, on his boat, and feeling like a king.
king. Yes. And just when you think there's nothing left, there is suddenly something that is bursting with plenitude. At 20, 20 years and 15 days, I started to be given the response by being stripped of everything that had been put on me. And what was left was what's left when nothing is left. And afterwards, you have only one thought, only one thought that what had been there should be there all the time. Your only thought is to find that minute, those minutes when you felt so absolute, and invincible. You want to understand it. No, you want to do more than that. You want to touch it again. For me, a period after the camps was probably more dreadful than during the camps. I had a few difficult years, wondering whether I was going to survive or not. Because, you see, that minute, those minutes, months, when that force was holding me, it was gone. I found myself back in everyday life. But I was a devastated man. So how do you hold up then? For a long, long time I had moments of disgust. Very destructive urges. It was a shattered life. What had I to look for? What had the West to offer me? Nothing was natural anymore. I felt I was on another planet and it was unbearable. I had become a member of the École Coloniale in Paris. I had a cousin who had just become governor of Pondicherry in French India. And one day he said to me, how would you like to come to India with me? It was my salvation. I really didn't know what I would have done in Paris. He took me with him. It was my salvation. So here I am in Pondicherry. In Pondicherry, there's the Sri Aurobindo ashram. One day, I thought I'd pay it a visit. The first time I saw Sri Aurobindo, I was filled by the same thing that I had gropingly experienced as a child that I had touched in the camps. And it was there, right in front of me, alive. It was there in a gaze. You see, with Shula Aurobindo, it was quite special. He never saw anyone. But three or four times a year, his disciples or whoever else wanted to, was allowed to pass in front of him. It's what's called a darshan in India. So that day I followed the crowd and passed in front of him, thinking Sri Aurobindo was a great thinker, and that's all. Sri Aurobindo was 
a great thinker, a philosopher. Through the little I had read of him, just to acquaint myself, I thought he was a great thinker. But it wasn't a thinker that I met. It was a gaze. It was a being that I met. He was seated in a large armchair with mother beside him and there was a sort of procession. Actually, you pass in front of him in order to be looked at by him, not for you to look at him, so that that gaze could open up that door in us, the door that fills. And suddenly, I felt that I was home. I was in a place where I could breathe. I was home. It lasted, oh, I don't know, about four seconds. Four seconds. And I shall never forget it. So I decided I had to live that. I thought if one man can embody that, be that, which I thought was mine, then that's what I must be. That's what I must find. But I wasn't ready yet. I still had a lot of journeying to do. And besides, it was an ashram. An ashram is another church for me. And I just couldn't take that. Walls and me. All walls are a prison to me. Whether they're from the Orient or from the West, it doesn't make any difference. So joining that ashram was out of the question. Absolutely out of the question. But that gaze kept pursuing me. That minute, that minute of being kept pursuing me. So I left Pondicherry. First, I went to Paris. I had no idea what I was going to do. But one day I was walking down the street and I passed a travel agent. And in the window of this travel agent was a large map of the world with shipping lines marked in red. So I said to myself, um, this one. At the end of that line was KN. So, good. KN is where I'm going. Now, KN is in South America. It's where the French government used to send all its prisoners and its hell on earth. And I was delighted. I thought, good, I'll go there. I'll go to hell. I'll go to the bottom of hell just to see what's in it. Because, you see, in my romantic imagination, KN stood for all sorts of hellish things. I thought, I'll go there. I'll go right to the bottom of hell and I will experience the same thing as I had experienced in the camps. I just want to be that. So I bought a steerage ticket and I went to KN, just like that. And that's where I discovered something marvellous. I roamed through Guinea with the life divine as my only baggage. Oh, and my Parisian shoes. And that's how I arrived in the jungle. Well, I had a few difficult days. Because you arrive in the forest 
with your Parisian shoes and you're suddenly face to face with an element. And for a few days that, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to put this, but I don't think I was afraid because I'd done enough things in my life not to be afraid anymore. But I had no idea what the jungle was. Well, I didn't know, did I? I didn't know how to live anymore. Much as in the camps, when I had been humanly broken, for the first few days, it was a physical, ordeal and suddenly you feel like a drowning man when you're faced with that you have no idea what the jungle can be it's an awesome teeming frightening world there's lots of snakes there's lots and lots of snakes. In fact, that's what made me... You can't walk three feet without meeting one. There are lots and lots of snakes. But it is such a fantastic world. So for a few days, I felt I was completely uprooted from my body. I didn't know where I was, physically. Then, all of a sudden, a sort of understanding took place between me and that forest. And I lived there. I lived for a whole year deep in the jungle. But I was still a good little middle-class Western boy. Despite everything, I'd had a very good French education. And there I was, in the middle of this cataclysm. It isn't a human world. It's really like entering another world. And that's why you feel shipwrecked. And suddenly I laughed. And I thought, well, if I put my foot on a snake, then I put my foot on a snake. And if I put my hand on a snake, then I put my hand on a snake. And I don't give a damn. And the moment I don't give a damn came from my heart, from my guts. It was over. After 10 or 11 months, I was truly happy. I had running moments of which I was airborne. I felt so light when I was in contact with that element. Then, I don't know the exact circumstances, but one day I said to myself, goodness, you're becoming a prisoner. You're becoming a prisoner of this forest. You're hooked. You become a bourgeois of the forest. That really gave me a job. And three days later, I was on my rowboat. It was over. I went back to Cayenne and decided I'd go to Brazil. I don't know what happened. I said, you're a prisoner. I had put on another suit of clothes, the clothes of a man of the woods. And I was very happy going round and round and round. And I could have stayed there 30, 40, 50 years and probably died there. And then what? My secret still eluded me. I took a plane and I landed on the Amazon River. There I had all sorts of 
new adventures. But I was in a bit of a dilemma in Belem. I was tempted to take a boat and go up the Amazon River. And then I thought, well, you're going to repeat the jungle. You're not going to do that twice, are you? So I left Belem. I got trucks and all sorts of different transportation. But then I thought I'd go to the interior of Brazil and just see what happens. On my way from Bahia, I went through what they call the Sateo. It's a, it's a sort of desert-like region in the middle of Brazil. And I came down with a terrible fever in my truck. I thought perhaps I'd contracted malaria or something. But I wasn't worried because I don't believe in illness. But since I was burning with fever, the truck driver dropped me off in a village, laid me down somewhere, and off we went. So, that was another kind of ordeal. I didn't have a penny left. I hardly knew three words of the local language. And I had a fever. whose cause I didn't know. But it just so happened that some planters were passing through the village. And someone saying there's a gringo over there. And he said, and those planters just happened to be French. Well, I don't know if you can imagine. In the middle of Brazil, in some remote village, some French planters just passing, and someone saying, there's a gringo over there, and he's dying. Will you do something? They put me in their pickup truck and took me away. They had a cocoa plantation. And I recovered very quickly and very rapidly because I don't believe in illness. Certain things have to be purged, that's all. And immediately one of them said, do you know how to ride a horse? Of course I know how to ride a horse, I said. Naturally, I had never sat on a horse in my life, but I had to play my role. I had to be capable. They took me to a very pretty place. It had hills and forests, and some of those hills were covered in cocoa trees. And they said, here, it's all yours, just for the taking. I looked at all that and I rather pictured myself as a planter. Yes, a planter for life. Suddenly I saw the whole picture. What on earth are you doing? What on earth are you doing here? So you'll grow cocoa and you'll take your bags of cocoa to the village and you'll weigh them in the village and you'll follow the market price. There's a stock market for cocoa. And you'll try and make your bags of cocoa 50 cruzeiros, more than the week before, if possible. I saw myself in all that, and I said, no, it's not possible. The next day, I was gone. It was over. I left behind some very disappointed planters.
And I went south to Minas Gerais. I had to earn a living, I had nothing. Minas Gerais is just north of Rio de Janeiro. I became a prospector of mica. There are mica mines in Brazil, a lot of mica mines in Brazil. And mica just happens to be a rare mineral. I started to prospect for mica for a local company who had a field office in some remote village that you could only get to on horseback or by jeep. I prospected for mica for about five or six months. The company was owned by an American, an American from Boston, an elderly American, and a very nice man. But one evening, I looked at all that. You know, there are times when your eyes are open. They rest there, fixed. Everything is sort of engraved. You don't know why, you don't know how. My eyes were fixed on that little beach and on that very pretty Brazilian girl lying beside me. And the mica mines over there and the yacht waiting for me. And I thought, what are you doing? What on earth are you doing? I couldn't take a minute more. I just couldn't. That evening, we sailed back to Rio de Janeiro. I went to see the charming American, and I told him I was leaving. For where, he said. Africa, I told him. He thought I'd gone mad. He thought I'd gone completely mad. During the few months that I had prospected for MICA, I saved a little money. So I went to the company Transatlantique and I said, do you have a boat leaving for Africa? And I was told there were some luxury liners bound for France. We stopped at Dakar. Good, I said. And I bought a steerage ticket for Dakar. Just like that. And I had nothing, just enough to pay for my passage. When I arrived in Dakar, I had to find a hotel. The hotels were jam-packed, full of people. So I took a taxi to find a hotel. I'm watching the meter going up and up and up, using my last few francs, when we found a hotel. But well, <laughs> actually, it was a bit of a hovel. It was on the suburbs of Dakar. I was offered a room to share with someone, a young man. And the first thing this someone said to me was, I hope you don't mind sharing a room with a Jew. Well, why should I? All the Jews I've met are very nice people. They're very generous people. Why did he? I just couldn't understand the question. For me, a Jew, a black, a Chinese, they're all human beings. I don't know how people can see the difference. And eventually my, my young friend was so overcome by my natural reaction, he said, and what are you up to? Well, I said, I'm broke and I want to see Africa. I want to go to the Sahara Desert. I really would like to go to Zinda. Well, my means are very limited. I sell LaRousse dictionaries to blacks. But if you like, we could sell LaRousse dictionaries together. The proposal seemed a bit odd. I mean, I just couldn't see myself selling dictionaries. But then I thought, why not? I've come so far. So we traveled from village to village, truck to truck. We went to Dahomey, Niger, the Ivory Coast. We traveled up, all the while selling dictionaries. 
which actually sold very well and allowed us to travel even farther. So I arrived in Zinder with my obsession. I wanted to touch an element. All my life, I've always been able to breathe in an element, to experience an element. The rainy season had started, and I was told the road is closed. So I was stuck there, right in the middle of Africa, unable to realize my dream, which was to plunge body and soul into the Sahara Desert and lose myself a little. I quite like losing myself a little, losing myself. So, no desert. I was stuck in Zinda. But then there was something else. I still had the life divine with me. That's the only thing that followed me everywhere. The book by Sri Aurobindo. Yes. That's what I'm looking for. The divine life. Well, I didn't even know what divine meant. But let's say a breathable life. A real life. The life divine for me meant a life in which you could breathe. And that's what I had felt in flashes throughout my life. That's what I'm looking for, the divine life. I said to myself, well, why don't you go and see for yourself? Because I could see the whole picture. You add one adventure, plus one adventure, plus one adventure. The circle closes and you finish up as a professional of the jungle, a professional of sailing, a professional of plantations. You confine yourself, you see. You close yourself in, as it were. You put on another suit of clothes. Was it conceivable that they had the permanent secret waiting there for me? in Pondicherry with Sri Aurobindo. I said to myself, well, why don't you go and see for yourself? But I was scared because it was an ashram. It was more walls. But I felt at least there's one person there. There's the mother, Sri Aurobindo's companion. Perhaps there's a secret waiting for me. So I bought a plane ticket and I went back to India to find that secret, but not just a fleeting secret, the secret that would be there all the time, every minute of the day, something free of any clothes, something natural. So I came directly back to Pondicherry. I was 30. I was actually very scared. I was scared, I knew that. I'd gone through many adventures, but I thought, this one, to see the mother, to go to that ashram, I sensed that one couldn't bungle that adventure. And if it was bungled or unsuccessful, it would mean a line of dead-end adventures. Something Something had to happen. But Mother, I'd seen Mother with Sri Aurobindo during that first circuit of mine. And she had a, a different kind of gaze than Sri Aurobindo. A different kind of gaze. In fact, what overwhelmed me when I first met her was her gaze. It seemed that for the first time, somebody was looking at me with love. It was a gaze that went deep into your chest and pierced something open there. A 
rather overwhelming experience and a bit scary. With Mother, it was quite extraordinary. It was a, a sword, but a sword filled with love. It wasn't something that went up into infinity. It was something that went down into matter, into the heart. For me, at least. So I arrived in Pondicherry, and I really didn't feel comfortable. I dreaded that ashram. I remember walking along the seashore one day, and there were some catamarans beached on the sand, and I hid behind one of them to smoke my last cigarette. And I said to myself, well, my dear fellow, this is your last cigarette you're going to join an ashram. But I'm stubborn, I'm Breton. I said, you're, you're going to stay for two years. You're not gonna leave after the first obstacle. So I stayed, but I fought with mother. I fought with mother for two or three. I fought with mother for six years. And I would leave the ashram. And then I would come back again. And then I would leave again. I had met a sannyasi. Sannyasi is a sort of monk. Monk is just a word, by the way. It's got nothing to do with any particular religion. But they are people who have burned everything. They wage an all-out revolution, so to speak. And they walk the roads as beggars. So I thought, maybe this is the ultimate adventure to burn everything, to go to the end, and I mean the end of the end. I had to find out what was inside that human flesh. That was it. That's what was driving me. So I left. I went to Ceylon to join that sannyasi. And thus began a very strange adventure, which was extremely enlightening for me in a negative way. He was in a temple. He lived there as a beggar in the temple. I arrived there, put on the loin cloth, what they call dhoti, made of white cloth, a scarf around my neck, and I slept in the temple, on the flagstones, the only place you could sleep. I ate whatever the sannyasis got from begging. And I wanted to be like everyone else, so I put white ashes on my forehead. And I lived there. I have no words for it. I got sick almost immediately. Well, of course, I was drinking the water straight out of the river. We begged for our rice. They gave us rice full of spices, what they called chilies, and they burnt my guts. I was soon in a pretty bad physical shape, but I followed that sannyasi. One day we went to a small temple. There were other sannyasis. We made a fire and I was naked before the fire. And the sannyasis started to chant Sanskrit mantras. He told me the gestures, the things I had to do, but it was always the same gesture. You threw everything into the fire in the symbolic form of a grain of rice, oil, or clarified butter.
You threw everything. You even threw mental realization. You threw every possible realization. You put good, you put evil, you put joy, you put sorrow, all the yeses and noes of the world. You threw everything. I don't want joy, I don't want sorrow, I don't want good, I don't want evil. I want the thing that is. The thing that does not change. The thing that does not vary. When that Holocaust was over, he gave me an orange dyed piece of cloth, a dote, to wrap around myself. A necklace of rude draksha beads for reciting mantras and a copper bowl for my food and water. And I was nothing except that beggar who had burned everything. Then I wandered the roads. I did all sorts of things. Then I went to the Himalayas and I traveled some more. But fairly soon something happened. What I wanted is something that is, that is true, you know, and that Grace, which is always there, gives you answers. One day in the Himalayas, I met what is called a Nanga Sanyasi. That's a naked sannyasi. He has nothing. He doesn't wear a loincloth. Well, he's naked. I decided to walk along with him. I said, listen, I want to get rid of these clothes. I was ashamed of these sannyasi clothes. It was part of a disguise or a parody or something to wear clothes of the same color. One had to be completely naked. Yes, another kind of uniform, another way of saying I'm a bit of this and a bit of that. I suddenly developed a, a revulsion against all that. So I said to him, I want to be naked like you. And I looked at my white skin, so terribly white, a stigma of the West. But you can't get rid of your sannyasi clothes. You can't. It isn't your law. I squeezed his arm. I said, what law? But you're a sannyasi, he said. I began to feel stifled by that label. I was a sannyasi, so I can't do this and I can't do that. All right. You walk the roads and then you walk the roads. How long are you going to walk like that? What then? Well, then I shall walk some more. Yes, but afterwards, afterwards. Well, when it's over, your body gets burned and it's over. You're free. My whole being was suddenly filled with an an incredible outrage. So we walked through all this, suffered through all this, lived through all this just to end up tossing it into the fire like an old rag? What's the point of this life then? Is the aim really to go and sit in some remote corner of the Himalayas in contemplation until the end? Is that it? I wanted something that would fill me by walking down the street or drinking a scotch if necessary. Something that I was doing while living life. I wanted something not dependent on anything. 
All those practices are a damned illusion. And that's where that sword, that sword of light, that mother's gaze was, drew me back. Because it wasn't something that soared upwards and left you with a feeling of vastness and serenity and bliss. On the contrary, it was something that went down into your flesh and touch something open there in the depths of your being. So that gaze brought me back to Pondicherry. I said to myself, you fled. You didn't have the guts to face that. So I came back to Pondicherry. I had read some of Sri Aurobindo. Well, <laughs> true, I'd read some of Sri Aurobindo. But it felt as if I was reading through the pages. So it wasn't even his philosophy that I knew very little of that really attracted me. I had finished with the intellect at 19. I had read hundreds and hundreds of books and I realized that no answer could be found in books. And gurus, well, personally I find Guru's dreadful. I can't put it any other way. And yet, this is obviously just a manner of speaking because everything is a guru. I can't stand, I can't stand those people. I see through them very quickly. I admit some of them are absolutely sincere. But look at what their disciples make of them. That's what's repugnant. They make them into divinities. And then it's quite convenient, you see. A guru, well, my guru is there. He will do it for me. It completely relieves you from making any personal effort yourself. Ah, my guru is there. He will do it for me. My guru, my guru, my guru. It's always the same old thing, that God relieves you from being, from becoming what you are. Mother said it very well. She said it's laziness. It's laziness that makes one worship. What one has to do is to become. But to become takes guts. There's no room for dozing off, you see. And that's what Mother's Sword was all about. You can't doze off. You couldn't doze off. You can't leave it for someone else to do it for you. And that's why I came back. At the end of that journey, I came back to that ashram. I realized I had to get rid of all my phobias about walls and structures for her, that is. She was the one I wanted to see. And that's where another grace was given to me. But I think we all have the grace commensurate with our call. Depends on what we call. And she probably felt that call in me. And with her smile, her uh, irony, her challenge, there was always a challenge. Let's see if you can. Try. There was always a challenge. I like the English word for it. There was a sentence by Sri Aurobindo that followed me for a long time. In fact, from the moment he saw me. And I took that sentence around the world without understanding its implication or what to do about it. 
I remember he said in the Life Divine, and I'm not quoting exactly, man is not the summit of evolution. He is a transitional being. If he does not surpass himself, he will be surpassed. It seemed as if he got to the heart of the question. So I came down from the Himalayas, at a gallop this time, to be with Mother. Because, you see, some of her words, too, actually struck me. Okay, it's all right to say man is not the summit of evolution. We are on our way to another stage of evolution. But how? By what means? And that's where one of Mother's sentences really struck me. In fact, it was the key for me. One day she said, this physical body is capable of a progressive development in evolution. It's the physical body that will make the bridge. It isn't on the summit of consciousness above, on a razor-sharp point, so sharp that it ends up vanishing, that we move to something else. Or one moves out of humanity, out of evolution, out of everything. It's in the body. So how do we incarnate that divine life? She was there in the ashram. I said to myself, you came through the jungle, why can't you go through an ashram? An ashram Parsi doesn't mean anything. A being has an experience, incarnates an experience, and the quality of that experience attracts a number of people who want to participate in that experience or find out what it means. Personally, what I found at the end of my journey was somebody telling me it's the body that will make the bridge. It is not occult powers. It is not yogic powers, not philosophy. It isn't the Upanishads. It isn't even the Bhagavad Gita, not any text. It's in the body. The body doesn't have a philosophy, you see. It sleeps well, it doesn't sleep well. It's hungry, it's cold. That's what the body is. So she was telling me the secret, and that's why I came back, to find out what the secret of that body was. But what was marvelous to me was mother was never teaching. Mother explored. She had nothing to teach. She would talk to me like one does a child, by telling them stories. And I would ask her any question that came into my mind. And she would answer all my questions. And slowly, slowly, she led me into her own exploration. So what is that yoga in the body? All right, at the time it was 1960, and it was obvious that the world couldn't wait thousands and thousands of years. The problem was just around the corner. An answer had to be found. And where in the body was that answer? Since the biologists aren't going to find it. What in fact is the body? It seems utterly simple, but it's 
the thing we know the least. What do we know about our body? We are wrapped in an accumulation of successive layers. We are physiologically prisoners. We are in a bowl. And the outside of the bowl is not death. And you don't get to the outside of the bowl by improving the instruments that belong to the inside of the bowl. One day, in the Paleozoic era, some fish found themselves in a dried up water hole. And out of necessity, they had to find a new mode of breathing. They had to get from gill respiration to pulmonary respiration. And since they were being more and more asphyxiated, they had to find a new way of breathing. Amphibians were born. They left their fishbowl. They left their bowl to find that the other side of the bowl was not death. It was just another way of breathing. It's a whole new different way of being, which mother stammered out day after day after day for 19 years. I listened to her for 19 years. A lot of people thought mother was becoming unhinged. It's very eccentric to get out of the human skin into another way of being. And in all this, I was the one, I realize now, I was the one who said yes. Yes, it's possible. It's the only possibility. We've had enough of the Vedas and Marxism and the Bibles and the old human stories. We must find a new mode of breathing. And that's where I plunged with mother. Yes, plunged. I was there. I was like a drowning old man trying to find a new way of breathing. And I think that all the suffering in the world, which is so stifling and on the verge of collapse, is evidence that we are nearing the point when we will be able to collectively break the fishbowl and emerge where? In the human being, really. Something we are not yet at all.